First of all, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you being here. And uh, the opportunity here to, to uh, have a conversation about my decision to retire at the end of this season and answer any questions that you might have. Obviously, um, this fall would have been my 50th year on the campus here at the University of Minnesota. And I've had an amazing, obviously, run and career and a very humbling experience. Grateful to the University of Minnesota, the athletic department, all the athletic directors that I've had an opportunity to work with and administrators and support people, uh, the support assistant coaches. I've just been surrounded by a tremendous amount of talent throughout my career. And uh, I've been fortunate that uh, we've been able to have some success on the diamond. But more importantly, I think we've been able to graduate our young men at a very, very high level and prepare them for the next 50 years of their life. So um, I have... Uh, uh, I have to pinch myself sometimes. It's a little bit surreal. Uh, I find myself reflecting a little bit more. And where did the time go? Um, when I arrived in the fall of 74 to try to be a pitcher for the legendary coach Dick Siebert, and uh, the first player I met was Paul Molitor and saw him take batting practice, and I knew my career was coming to an end pretty quickly, so um, better find something else to do. But I surely didn't write a career paper in eighth grade about being a Division One baseball coach for 43 seasons. Um, but uh, matter of fact, uh, my mother wanted me to be a priest, so I wrote a career paper on being a priest. But uh, uh, maybe I didn't get too far away from that because uh, we do some counseling and mentoring and uh, trying to help young people find their way and, and uh, you know, have some conversations around some of the adversity and struggles we all face in our life. So um, uh, here we are. But uh, it wasn't planned. Uh, I'm not sure it will ever happen again. I was 26 years of age. I had no head coaching experience. And... And uh, matter of fact, uh, as an assistant coach for three years with George Thomas, we both worked on the outside. We were part-time employees, had jobs outside the university and did both. And uh, people probably don't know this, but in the summer of 81, I was thinking about getting out. I worked for Emory Air Freight and uh, in sales, and they wanted me to make a decision, either one or the other. And uh, I was probably on my way out. And then George Thomas called me and told me he was retiring, and then Paul Giel who was our athletic director, one of our first really you know, prominent baseball players in the history of this program, was the athletic director and, and uh, offered me the opportunity to be the head coach here. And, and uh, some people ask how did that happen. I said I was available and I was cheap. So that's probably not too far from the truth. Um, but it was daunting uh, to take over a program with the history and tradition. It's the oldest program at the University of Minnesota sports program. And I'll be honest with you, um, it's haunting and daunting to uh, take a look at the history and tradition and try to be able to figure out a way to continue that and add to it as we went along. And, um, you know, I was 26 my first year, and I had the three Steinbach brothers on that team. Uh, Timmy was the oldest, Tommy and Terry, and Timmy was fifth-year guy who was 23, so our ages weren't that far apart. Um, but uh, anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. Again, I'm grateful, thankful for the wonderful career I had, my family and I, and and um, obviously the program will always be special to me. I'll open it up for questions. John, what are some of the challenges that you have as a as a coach, particularly with NIL and the transfer portal that maybe you might not have had decades ago? Well, there's no question that's created a whole other set of challenging circumstances. I think. Um, when you're a program, we're the probably the, we're the second furthest northern program in America, and you're starting your season this Friday in the middle of the winter time, right? And so you've always had the challenge of the weather, and obviously we've been fortunate that we had the Metrodome to offset some of that over the years, and then U.S. Bank Stadium more recently, except for this year, which is disappointing. But um, I think first and foremost, you have a program that's you know uh, centered in a, in a climate that's not conducive, especially when you start the season in the middle of February for being able to develop your program. You've got to practice inside. You've got to be really good at doing player development indoors, trying to be creative, find ways to prepare your team. We made history this year. We played baseball outside in January and February in Minnesota and almost 50 years in this campus. It'll probably be another 50 years before that happens again. But uh, we got outside six days and you know, you can work on cutoffs and relays in full space and pop-up priority and uh, see balls off the bat. We scrimmaged uh, three times out there with live pitching. Um, so we made some history. I'll, you know, 
I'll tell people for years now we played baseball outside in January and February. They'll think I've lost my mind probably. But so, but really, it's the challenge to me is is first and foremost is trying to to develop your team uh, in a in a climate like this, where you're trying to compete with people that have uh, better weather year-round to do that, and uh, not only in the nationally, but even in our own footprint in the Big Ten Conference. So. Um, I think that's first always been the big challenge, and then convincing kids to come to Minnesota to play in some cold weather and develop in, indoors and in, in different spaces. And I think we do have a track record of developing players and finding a way to do that player development system, evidenced by the number of all Big Ten players or players of the year, people want to play professional baseball, Major League Baseball. So I think when I look back, I think we've done a really pretty good job of player development considering some of the challenges that we have here. Now you're in a new. Now you're into a whole new territory with NIL. College athletics has been turned upside down. Name, image, and likeness. The transfer portal. Also understand what's happened uh, through the pandemic. The draft got reduced from 40 rounds to 20 rounds, and they eliminated 42 minor league teams. So the pressure that's been on the game, in my opinion, since uh, the pandemic started, you had that and the loss of practice and games and all the things that came with that is. And then players got an extra year of eligibility. So I've seen so many 23- and 24-year-olds playing college baseball the last few years. The players that used to sign as juniors don't sign anymore because there's, only, there's less minor league opportunity, so half, about 50% less opportunity. And then you add the fifth- and sixth-year guys with the extra year of eligibility from the pandemic. And then the transfer portals become the free agent pool. That's where you go for if you want to go and the free, be a free agent. And people like it or not, there's people working around the edges trying to get people to leave programs to go to other programs to build national championship teams out of the transfer portal and with NIL money. LSU won the national championship last year. They had $100,000 in NIL money in their team. And they advertise it regularly about come to LSU, we got money, we want to build a championship team. And I think I'm afraid going forward what may happen here is the northern schools, the mid-majors, you develop, recruit somebody and develop a player, uh, there's no guarantee you're going to keep them unless you can come up with uh, enough cash uh, to keep them in your program. And uh, we had a situation with a player this summer that had an opportunity to leave be for, for those reasons. And fortunately, he stayed. Uh, he's one of our best pitchers. Um, I said this to others. If Max Meyer in 2018, when he was a fresh All-American freshman of the year, if he was in this current landscape, he'd have so many offers around the country to leave here. He was the first pitcher taken in the draft in 2020. Um, so um, that's what you're faced with. So now you can recruit guys and you can develop guys. It doesn't mean they're going to stay your best players. Um, and I'm not complaining. It's a fact of life. It's the climate we're living in. It's, it's, it's reality. Um, and then um, so it, 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 I obviously have been in the game a long time. I know colleagues all over the country, and many of them tell me between scholarships, uh, Alston money now, the 5980 that kids have access to, um, the NIL money. If you're, some of the schools have need-based aid, they have academic aid. Look at the top 25. There's a lot of private schools in there because they have more resources and need-based aid and academic aid that doesn't count in 11.7 totals. And, and, and so I, coaches that tell me every guy in their roster is on some combination of money for a full scholarship. I call college athletics right now. We don't have a salary cap. There's no salary cap anymore. Scholarship used to be the salary cap to some degree. You still had the need-based aid, the academic aid. Some states have lottery scholarships where if you're a 3.0 student in Louisiana, you can go to LSU and you get a tuition waiver. So it doesn't, that's extra aid you don't have to take out of your 11.7. But there's no salary cap any longer and, um, in any of our sports. And so um, try to develop a team and build a team. So the concern I have is even though you recruit some guys and develop them, you know, how do you maintain a team? How do you keep your team together unless you have the resources to do that? Um, that, to me, is going to be one of the big challenges going forward as they figure out the NIL piece and how to get some guardrails back on this thing to stay competitive. Everybody get a competitive chance. Um, and we're, we're in it. We're in the space. I mean, we're in the transfer portal, and you call kids up, and they say, great, I'd love to come to your program. How much NIL money do you have for me? That's their first question. How much money do you have for me? You can find guys, but you got to be able to have the resources. And and um, former coach at Michigan, Eric Bockich, is now at Clemson. I, he just came out the other day and said to keep his team together, he needs a million dollars. So um, that's where we're at. 
Um, so it doesn't resemble the college athletics that I joined way back in the 80s here. Um, so you ask what's changed. Those are some of the big changes. And then even people are enticing kids who get to be late round draft choices not to sign because they give them more money to stay in school than to go play minor league baseball. So college baseball talent level has never been higher. I don't think it's going to change. Now, I think this is pretty much the last year of the extra year of eligibility. But Michigan ran three guys out there last year on the mound that were fifth and sixth year guys that had between 225 and 240 innings in college. Unheard of. Um, 23 to those guys were pitched there playing minor league baseball just a few years ago. And we played Mississippi in our Cambria College Classic last year. They won the national championship in 22. And after the game, I looked at their lineup, and they had a collection of guys back from that team, and then they added in some pieces from the transfer portal. And I looked up how many Division I at-bats they had in their lineup. They had 3,100 at-bats in Division I baseball. And I looked at ours, we had 1,200. And um, so um, pay attention to that piece because it's, 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 it's affecting the competitive cycle, no question about it. And, and um, so those are some of the things that I see, and um, let alone the – you know, I just saw the, the 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 coaches' salaries, the commitment to facilities in college baseball, the people building eighty, ninety million dollar facilities and drawing three hundred thousand people in the south, um, and the coaching salaries how they dramatically have raised. I read an article two or three years ago. There were there were uh, there were eight college coaches making more than ten major league managers in college baseball a few years ago. So. The level of commitment in some parts of the country is gigantic, and um, and uh, we know who we are here. Not complaining. I understand who we are. I think we have to understand what we value and what we need to do to have a successful and competitive program. And we have over the years. And we're in a new time, a new era, and you're going to have to adjust. I've had to adjust many times in terms of my career, in terms of how we do things, and how we coach, and how we recruit, how we develop players, and throw in the whole. Uh, science piece that we're involved in today and data collection and high-speed video and and track man and horizontal break and vertical break and spin rates and launch angles and bat speed exit speeds and if you want to recruit kids today you got to be in those spaces because they're all exposed to them in their travel ball and their club teams they all want to know what you have for technology what you're going to do to help them get better and so you got a big investment in technology today uh, and you got to have people that understand how to Take that data, how to take that technology and use it to, to make players better. And uh, that's a science in itself. So you better have an understanding of the kinetic chain, science and physiology, the human body, uh, how it moves, uh, all the things that come with that, uh, if you're going to use that to your advantage to develop players. And we don't do bullpens without having an iPad out there with TrackMan and, and measuring horizontal and vertical break, spin rates, where stuff plays. Um, it's a long way from 1982, I can tell you that. Um, and um, when I was a head coach and had a graduate assistant as an assistant coach, the two of us were trying to do it. So what I've witnessed in terms of changes from then to now is incredible. But the game's better. Players are better. They're better coached. The game's more competitive across the board. I just question about how we're going to be able to keep the game competitive on the national level with the changes that have gone on and, spite it and throw the weather on top of it. So it's a long answer. But... There's a lot of forces at play. It's never just a couple of things. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm sure he'd have some interesting comments to say. Um, you know, but he was, he was an innovator. He was, he was a big part of the game really starting to move in the direction it did. You know, he, he was involved in starting the National Coaches Association, did a lot to, to foster and grow amateur baseball. He brought the aluminum bat into the game, good batter and different, but it saved money at the time. Unfortunately, technology kind of got ahead of itself and kind of hurt the game there for a while. He was involved in getting the College World Series going and the regional play. He was very innovative. He loved to teach the game. He was a big player development guy. He loved to teach fundamentals. I think he would say, you know, this is interesting, man. This is more data. He kept stats and data on everything with a calculator and pencil and set up machines in the cages and we'd have well hit averages against right handed breaking balls, left handed breaking balls, fastballs. He did it with charts and, you know, a calculator and a pencil. And so um, look where we are today. And I did a lot of those charts and I figured out the well hit percentages and the strike percentages and all the things were so that was the that was the early stages of analytics that was done with paper and calculator. He was very innovative. 
and trying to develop a player development plan indoors for two and a half, three months before you played your season where you could accurately measure the progress and the development of your team. I still have those charts. I still have some of his notes. Um, I used a lot of it in the beginning of my career. And uh, scouting back then was I used to get the papers from the student papers from the different schools in the league sent to the mailroom here, go through them, and hopefully you could find out, well, they suicide squeezed in the bottom of the seventh with this guy. You read the article, just get a sense for what their team was like. There was no internet. There was no – now we can – we have a system now, Synergy. We can go on there and I can watch every at-bat of a kid on a team that he's had in his career looking at against right-handed pitching, left-handed, any way you want to break it down. You can go in there, you can watch the kid, watch a pitcher. You can simulate his – spin rate and his vertical and horizontal break on the computerized pitching machines we have in the hitting facility. So um, that's what it's come to. And uh, so, and we have a group of managers that do a lot of work in our analytics space that want to get into that space long-term that are in school here to, to, to in the analytics space. And so they do a lot of work for us to dev bring data to us, whether it's for scouting, whether it's for player development, they run our high seed video and game day and practice and, all of, and they break it all down for us so we can view it and, and, and analyze it. So go back to 1982 to, you know, 2024, and it's an entirely different way we're coaching than we used to. And it's a good thing, but it takes, it takes more people, and it takes people with backgrounds uh, that are able to, to use the technology to do player development. Yeah, be careful not to eliminate compete factor in there. I mean, you look around your program, and right here is a good example, right over here. I mean, I mean, you've got a lot of high compete guys. Where does that factor in when you're watching the kid where you go, well, the analytics he'll figure out because he's so driven? I think, Mike, we're looking, first of all, uh, I've always been a big believer in athleticism. Harder to find two- and three-sport athletes today. I always loved athleticism, guys that played more than one sport. I think you are looking for the intangibles. I still think the intangibles are a big piece of – uh, of what you're going to get uh, out of an individual, you know, uh, makeup, how they handle adversity and failure, right? How internally motivated are they? You know, how, how interested are they in staying connected to their teammates and helping them become better players, not just their own careers and their own selves. So we're looking for guys that want to be leaders and leadership and, and, and uh, be a part of a team and create a team culture that we can uh, have a uh, productive uh, team around. So I still think the intangible piece, you can talk about spin rates and velocities and all these things. I still think it comes down to character. This thing comes down to intangibles. I still think it comes down to athleticism. I think the guys with athleticism are able to make changes and adjustments, and you can take some of the data and stuff, and you can make them better because of the way their bodies move. They're very athletic. Um, but um, so, I, you know, I, I still think you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for intangibles. Many times when I go to games, I don't want the kids to know that I'm there because I want to see how they, what they, how they handle adversity when something bad happens. I want to see – how well they're connected to the other kids on their team, and are they helping the kids that aren't very good players or don't play very well? How do they respond to the, the mistakes that they make? And that tells me something about their character and makeup. And um, I still think that's a piece, and still a big piece in it. Um, it's still it's a it's a relationship business. It's still a people business. You can talk about analytics, but it's still about developing trusting relationships with your players. Um, that they trust you and, and uh, you can have conversations. You're willing to have a growth mindset, listen to what you have to say about helping them get better. So the relationship piece, the trust piece, developing relationships with these young men where you can get down to places where they're going to be willing to be open-minded and have honest conversations with them about where they're at and how they can get better. So I think the relationship piece and the intangibles is still the number one thing for me in spite of the other things are just pieces to help you develop players and make them better adult life here. Uh, how do you make the decision that this is the year I'm going to retire? I mean, there's so much that goes into it. It's, you know, you bleed maroon and gold. Uh, that had to be difficult. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I don't think it's a decision you wake up one morning and say you're going to retire, okay? So I think, first of all, over the last five or six years, I have tried to pay attention to where I'm at health-wise, where I'm at in terms of my energy level, my passion. It's a big commitment uh, in terms of time, um, you know, and you play in a, a you know, 56-game schedule and travel and practice and recruiting and all the things that come with it. So, so I've tried to pay attention to where I'm at and whether I have the energy and the passion and I can still come here each day and provide something to this program and to our players so they can have a meaningful experience. So I've seen guys stay too long. I uh, didn't want to be one of those. Try to really be intentional about paying attention to 
where I'm at. Uh, I'm going to be 69 in May. Um, my father passed away just short of his 75th birthday, so I've got some friends and some good friends and people I know that are either very sick or passed away, and you start to notice some of that and go, well, there's some other things I want to do in life, too. I want to get off the treadmill. Um, you know, uh, our daughter lives in her daughter Aaron lives in Denver and wants to spend more time with her. My wife, I want to travel, get back to some of my hobbies, spend some friends with more time with some of my lifelong friends and relationships we have and family. So I don't believe I'll be bored for a second, to be honest with you. But the hard part for me in this whole thing was whenever you make the decision, it's going to impact others. It's not just going to impact me. It impacts players in the program, impacts recruits, impacts assistant coaches. So it's not just about me. And so you try to say, where's the perfect time? There is no perfect time. There isn't. And that was the hardest piece for me. I always tried to find the window where I'd have the least impact, and I realized there isn't any. You're not going to find one. And so my wife and I and daughter have been talking about this over the last few years, just paying attention, when's the right time. The pandemic turned our program and everybody's program in college athletics upside down. It wasn't a fun period of time. We lost the games and practices, the impact on the kids. I didn't want to walk away from them in the middle of that. I felt like I wanted to try to get our program back to the baseline that we're, you know, what we have had here for years and years and years. I like the last few recruiting classes and the pieces we've added. I like where we're at right now. I think there's going to be a baseline here to move forward. Hopefully we can keep people here in the transition and not jump in the portal and leave. Um, but I feel good about where the program's at right now. And obviously we talked about the challenges going forward, but I do feel like the time's right. I feel like I have enough passion, energy, commitment to, to go through this the last time. And uh, we'll turn it over to the next uh, person and people, and and uh, hopefully they can continue our history and tradition. It's the oldest sports program here. I think this is our 136th season of baseball at Minnesota. So um, let's celebrate the fact that we've got a tremendous history and tradition with lots of success on and off the field. John, journey as a head coach what are you most proud of I'm most proud of the young men that came here earned their degrees and uh, developed into outstanding young men been able to follow their lives and their careers and their families and to watch somebody come in as a young 18 year old and to see them transition and grow and develop and get gain the right values and appreciation for what's important in life and um, not just focus on being the best baseball player they can be which they all are at 18 they all think they're going to be the next major league guy of course they're competitive I don't blame them I think the opportunity to try to speak to them in terms of what reality is when less than about one percent of the players that play this game at any level ever make a living at it so you you know I've always tried to preach let's have a balanced experience here where you can go in either direction but everybody gets told to take their uniform off and go home, right, at some point in your life. So you got to be prepared for that day, whether it's after a four-year career here or after a minor league stint or after playing even in the major leagues, you know. Speaking with Glenn Perkins the other day, you know, he, he's had to transition, and, and he thought he was just going to retire and not work anymore, and he found out, you know what, i got to have purpose in life. I want to do something, and I think what he's doing at the Minnesota Twins has been really good for him. And, and um, so he's made the transition. Um, but I, to me, I'll always remember, and then the guys that went through struggles or had adversity in their lives that you maybe played a little peeny piece in helping them get back on track. And, and there's many of those stories um, that I'm proud of, that we have been able to change some people's lives or their behaviors so they could have a better life based on where they are at, help them grow and mature and become independent critical thinkers and be able to make good decisions for themselves. I've never been about teaching dependency. I've always tried to teach people that they have to be internally motivated. I don't walk kids to class. If you want to get a degree, you know, minimal expectation, get out of, set your alarm, get out of bed and go to class. Let's start there. If i got to walk you to class, then I'm not going to be very effective at the things I'm supposed to be doing every day. And so um, that's why I talk about having the intangibles and trying to teach people, you know, life skills and, and uh, you know, what, uh, you know, responsibility and commitment and accountability means and, um, you know, to be a part of this program. And so I'm most proud. I think we've graduated in my career close to 94, 95% of the guys. And I think I'm most proud of that. 
and I'm most proud of them. We've had guys go on and make a living at the game and very successful at the game, and that's wonderful too because I think it does show that at least you did some things right from a player development standpoint, did help some people find their way from a baseball perspective. So, And I think that's helped us in recruiting because we could tell kids, hey, you can come to Minnesota. You know, you can get a great degree. We're going to polish you up for life here. And But you also can play in the big leagues because we have success stories here that prove that. And so you can do it all. Yeah, the climate's challenging, but uh, that's just a small part of it. There's no perfect place to live. There's no perfect climate. But uh, we do know that we can do the things that I think are going to be important, not your baseball career, but the rest of your lives. And, uh, you know, been in players' weddings, gone to many weddings, got many birth announcements. Um, so that tells you that the relationships meant something. Players or groups of players that oh. have changed your life and oh, taught yes. you something? Yes. Um, I'll try to. There's been many, okay. I will tell you very early in my career, as a young man, you won't even, his, his jersey is retired on the wall, pitched in one game here, David Jelesnik from Ely, Minnesota. It's going to be hard for me, so bear with me. Anyway. He was a strapping six foot five, two hundred twenty pound kid from Italy. He found out he had cancer when he was in ninth grade, um, a type of bone cancer, and a phenomenal athlete. And he overcame it, went to remission. And um, his senior year, he was pitching extremely well up there. And actually, through his battle from ninth grade on, he became really a spokesperson for children with cancer nationally and has appeared in many different forms of national uh, uh, publicity around the way his attitude and the way he lived his life and the way he dealt with adversity and it was always about everybody else never about himself so long story short and then it turns out my mother was uh, her first class she taught up in northern Minnesota his father was in her class so on top of it there was a connection there she's the one that sent me an article from the paper up there about David Chelesnik that's how recruiting was back then and um, because she had you know had his dad in class and I started digging into it calling the coach throwing the ball really well so I actually ironically drove up to northern Minnesota to see him pitch and it was in the ballpark where I played amateur baseball Marble Minnesota they're playing Greenway at Coleraine ballpark that I pitched in I see this big six foot five, two hundred twenty pound guy. I said, "This guy had cancer? You got to be kidding me!" And he was in remission, and you know, just the beginning of the radar gun thing. And he was throwing the ball up there pretty good. And I said, "Got to recruit this guy." And so we recruited him. And um, the day after he signed his tender that summer, he went back to Duluth to get checkup, and they found out his cancer was back. And um, I'll never. Never forget the phone call from him and his family. They said, well, I suppose now you're going to take my scholarship. We gave him a partial scholarship. You're going to take it away because I'm sick. And I said, absolutely not. You need us now more than ever. And I need you more than ever because I've witnessed the way you live your life. And so he came and um, joined our program in the fall and then turned out the cancer stayed active. He'd go down to Mayo every once a week um, on Mondays to get treatments and come back. And he always wanted to be involved in practice. And uh, just an incredible attitude, smile on his face, never once complained about what was going on in his life. I want to be here. I want to help our team. He was still pitching. I remember um, we'd run the mile for conditioning, and he always wanted to run, and his ankles would be folding over because of the cancer and the brittleness of his bones. Well, anyway, so we go on our spring trip to Texas, and he goes, and he's pitching against uh, this one pitching opportunity, and he was out there, and from strike foot, a bone busted in his foot. And that was the end. And so we came back, and he went back to the doctor. At, I remember at the old Siebert Field coming through the third base gate, the boot cast on his foot, and he's got a smile on his face. He walks over. Well, Coach, he said, we got a lot of good pitchers on the team this year, and, and uh, they don't need me, but I'm going to get healthy, and I'll be back next year, and I'll do whatever I can to support this program. And um, and uh, the way he lived his life, courage, and, and it dealt with adversity and his uh, love for others and caring about others and not never woe was me. Well, then uh, that fall, uh, they, his cancer got worse throughout the summer, and they planned a celebration of life for David at his home in Ely the day before Labor Day in 1984. 
and the team went up there and I went up there. We went up there celebration of life. And then I, afterwards I drove back to our family lake home up there, in the Iron Range, and I got a call at the cabin there from his mom and dad that he had passed that night. His only request was he wanted to be buried in his uniform, and which he wore once, and um, and um, such which we acknowledged. And um, and to me, at that point in my career, I was a lung coach, and I didn't understand some of the things we're talking about here. I was all about winning, and wanted to win more. It was less about developing people and preparing them for the next 50 years of their life and impacting people's lives. It was all about if you win today, you're a good coach, good person. You lose, you're a bad coach, bad person. And he shed some perspective on my life, that young man, based on how he lived his life. And after you followed it and studied it, that changed me, in my opinion, as a coach and my values and how I wanted to coach and how I wanted to treat people and the level of empathy that I wanted to show for young people. Now, that was the beginning, um, and I went on for the next seven or eight years, and I had lots of work to do, but uh, he surely got me pointed in the right direction, and I had some help along the way to make some additional changes I feel I had to make, or I don't think I'd be here today. If I hadn't, I had a very dear colleague, Rick Aberman, who helped me a great deal managing my life and world and making some changes in how I led people and connected with people and, and how I treated young people and, and, and uh, saw the world entirely differently. So. David was a big part of that. I have a picture of him uh, from the Metrodome in his uniform, and um, and uh, that's right outside my office door, and a little message about him and his impact. And, and we have an award every year we give in our program, the David Chelesnik Jr. Award, to the player that has overcome the most adversity, challenges, you know, emulated the qualities David has and uh, ever since his passing in, in 1984. And then the kids wore his number uh, in 85, and that team was really committed. And they ended up through a remarkable comeback in the season of winning the Big Ten Championship. And all year it was about, we got to do this for Chaz. They called him Chaz. We got to do this for Chaz. And they ended up coming back, and we had uh, close to our season ending a number of times before we won the Big Ten tournament that year. And the inspiration was him and he's inspired my life and whenever I feel sorry for myself or think I got it the worst than anybody else does or we lose a game or whatever might happen I constantly remember David and how he would respond and react to adversity so there's been many others but um, he's the one that jumped out at me probably at a time in my life when I really needed it. Just playing at Seabird Field, the personal connection is a story program. What has it meant to you, just with your personal connection, obviously, and then helping get it constructed? Well, I guess I've always felt like throughout my career, I was given a tremendous opportunity um, at a very young age to lead a storied program. And I still got to pinch myself when I say that. But um, I always said I want to try to leave the program in better shape than I found it. And I know Dick Siebert tried to do that every single day. And he's the one that got the old Beerman Field built. He worked very, very hard to improve and grow his program through his alumni and donors and fill in the gaps. And I always felt like I want to try to do whatever I can to make the place better than when I found it. I knew eventually we were going to need a new facility. And uh, you're going to have a Division One program. You have to have a Division One facility. But I've always felt all along, I hope I can leave the program in some way, uh, better in some ways than when I found it. And uh, I'm glad we were able to build a new facility and uh, uh, some of the other things we've been able to do to uh, help grow the program. So um, he was always uh, interested in growing and making the place better. I think you either grow or you die in this business. And so we had to keep finding ways to improve and grow the program. And obviously when the Metrodome was going away, we had to improve our facility. The other one was <coughs> Uh, no longer functional and um, fortunately we found some very very generous people out there donors that were able to help us and it was a big challenge uphill challenge um, to do that we knew that going forward but we had no choice we had to have a facility and fortunately we were able to tell our story about the program and successes and impact it's had and that people that wanted to support that and obviously the Polad family jumping in there at the beginning and making a very generous gift to, gift to get us started and you know a lot of the big money that was raised was not from former players. It was from people in the community that respected our program and what we did that wanted to help this program. And that, to me, really jumped out at me that there were people that 
understood our mission and our why and what we're trying to do here and were willing to support our program. They didn't have kids that played in the program or they didn't play in the program but wanted to support the program because they saw the impact it potentially was having, could potentially have going forward. And then to have the regional out there in 18 after raising that money, I mean, we had to raise close to $8 million. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't know if we were going to get there or not, but we had no choice, but we did. And and then to build a Perkins Performance Center afterwards uh, with Glenn's generous gift and a few others, um, you know, that to me are, are, are going to be always highlights because I feel like it's going to serve the program going forward as well and necessities if you're going to have a strong Division One program. Anything else for Coach? John, uh, your team this year, what, um, how do you like your pitching and uh, how do you think, um, how competitive do you think you'll be in the Big Ten? First of all, I think the key word here going into the year is health, healthy. We had a rash of injuries last year across our team, both mostly pitching but some position players that was uh, really challenging last year. Um, so I think the key for me was trying to get our – for us to be successful here, we have to have our best players on the field. And we didn't have that last year. Um, but we're healthy right now. First of all, we have our pitching coach back, Ty McDevitt, that was not with us last year, who's been two and a half year battle with Lyme disease, who's been with us through the fall and winter. He's doing great. He's made a tremendous, in my opinion, a tremendous difference in our team, in our program. He's an outstanding coach. Talk about a person that has the, all the skill sets we talked about you need. He's one that has those. He's involved in our player development cycle as well and, and, and our processes we put together. So having him back has been impactful. So health, number one, for him and health for our team. This is the healthiest we've been in the last 12 months. We had a tremendous fall practice. We had great weather. We've had a group of guys that showed up every day with a growth mindset. They wanted to learn. They wanted to be coached. They wanted to get better. We kept a number of guys here last summer to weight train. Some guys were rehabbing, trying to get back from their injuries. They really created a culture last summer. I think that uh, they were going to get after it um, and got after it. Um, I We had a great fall. We had, uh, winter practice has been outstanding. I've never seen a group show up every day and give us what they've given us. They've created a culture. They're really, really close. They love playing for each other. We have low egos, um, and we're healthy. Some of the younger freshmen and sophomore guys have gotten enough experience and at-bats now that I think we're starting to see uh, their careers go in a different, better direction. Um, and uh, I'll be honest with you, we had the highest GPA academically the fall we've had here, and we've had a lot of really good academic teams. I think it speaks to their level of commitment. I think it speaks to the intangibles, the commitment. If you can't be committed academically, you're surely not going to be committed on the baseball field. So you got to, the same skills are needed for both. And so this is the least amount of problems I've had that I can remember for a long time in terms of just trying to get people committed or on the same page or accountable and responsible for the expectations we have for people in this program. So it's, it's, it's been a joy, I'll be honest with you. Um, I keep waiting for something to happen. Um, and, uh, but we had a setback recently that um, it's going to be impactful. Uh, Noah Rooney, by our best reliever last year, he stepped out the last two or three weeks of the year. He had a bicep tendon issue left-handed pitcher. He rehabbed all summer fall, was back throwing 93-94, better breaking ball, going to probably be our closer. He just experienced an arm issue uh, a couple weeks ago. We're going to try to rehab him over the next two or three weeks, see if he can come back. I think it's low probability, but we're going to try. We have time. If not, he's going to end up having surgery. He'll miss the whole year. And uh, that's, that's Of all the guys on the pitching roster, that would be a guy I wouldn't want to lose. But at sports, there's injuries that happens. And Joe Hauser, we lost last March, is, uh, uh, blew out his knee in December, so he had knee surgery. He was going to be a piece of the back end of our bullpen. So those are the two guys. And then the two Tommy John guys, uh, Sam Kennedy's back, pitching pretty well. Had to bring him along slowly. He was a Gatorade Player of the Year in Minnesota senior year. T.J. Egan is not. His progress back from Tommy John has been slower, so he's not ready to help us yet. But... Pitching-wise, Will Sim, who missed the whole last year, big arm for us, was supposed to be a big part. He's healthy. Never thrown, seen him throw the ball better uh, than he has this fall and winter. Be one of our starters. Be a big, uh, be a huge getting him back. Connor Wheatgriff, who had a good year for us last year, will be our Friday starter. He's healthy. He's got a chance to be a high draft. Uh, he'll be with Tucker Novotny, who was our Friday starter last year, did a really good job as a sophomore, giving us a chance each Friday. He'll be one of our starting pitchers as well. Um, 
Seth Clausen, the back end of the bullpen's a junior now. He's better. Hokinson's going to be a two-way guy, right fielder, good hitter, defender. Because of Rooney's lost left-handed pitcher, uh, Hokinson's probably going to be one of the guys we're going to have to use in the bullpen a little bit more, but he'll be a two-way guy. Um, we picked up uh, three transfers out of the transfer portal I think can help us add depth. We didn't know if Sim and Egan and – you know, Hauser and Kennedy, they're going to be healthy this year, so we had to pick up some pieces to add some depth. We found three guys in the transfer portal that I think are going to help us. Uh, left-hander from Oregon State, Justin Thornstein's son, uh, that ties and Al Crawford have done a tremendous job of, of revamping his motion and his stuff. Pitched it unbelievably on Sunday for us. Um, so he's going to help us out of the bullpen. Uh, Tommy Gross, a transfer from Creighton, who has got a big arm and Coaches have done a tremendous job of trying to get more of his stuff into the strike zone and has improved a great deal since last fall. And then a transfer from North Carolina, Nick Argento, who's been injured the whole time there. He's from Wyzetta. Came back. He has not pitched Division One baseball because of his injuries, but he's healthy. He's got good stuff, but he's gonna, it's going to be bumpy for a while. But in a month or two, we might have some something special there. So, um, you know, I think we definitely have some options. Uh, I think we're much deeper because we're healthy on the mound. I think we go much deeper. I think our top 10 guys are much, or there's more talent, more experience there than there was last year. If you want to win consistently at this level, you've got to pitch. And we we got to play better defense than we did last year. Gave up too many free bases, wild pitches, pass balls, uh, errors. Uh, we've been, uh, the whole point of emphasis since last fall has been on defense. We've spent a, nor a large amount of time on improving our defense. And I've seen great progress there. We got to settle in on a shortstop. Um, that's a position, the most important position on the diamond. We've had really competition going on there all fall and winter. Ike Mazinga played most of the time there. He'll probably get the first shot there. But we're going to pick the guy that can play defense, Jake Larson, him. Have a freshman that I really like that's really making a push here, Jack Spanier from Cold Spring. He was a football quarterback there at Cold Spring. Had a chance to go to St. John's and be a quarterback there. He's a basketball player, baseball player, athletic, really athletic. He's pushing, um, but he's a freshman. We'll have to see how he holds up on the big stage on game day. Um, but we'll end up playing the guy. We'll find out who's going to be the best defender because we got to we got to play better on defense. So if you can, as Dick Sieber taught me many years ago, if you can pitch and throw strikes and play defense, you got a chance. And like I said, I think we have five or six hitters now that have enough experience that we can build a lineup around. I'm I, I'm confident we're going to run. We're going to put pressure on the defense. We have athleticism. Um, I just the whole roster to me looks. Normal looks like it's supposed to look like, and now we got to get out and play and see how we handle the bright lights of game day and how we manage our experience in the competitive environment, how we manage our emotions, how we're going to deal with the bumps in the road that are coming, right? The adversity you're going to have adversity, you're going to run into bumps in the road. How are we going to manage that? How are we going to respond? Those are things you can't practice and practice. So, but really happy. I think we've done everything we can to this point in preparation. Now you go outside, it's sun. Natural surfaces, we've been on turf, it's dirt, it's grass, first two weekends, um, how they respond to adjusting. You're going to play on major league surfaces, they're really fast. Uh, the grass in Fort Myers and in Surprise and the minor league complex, it's entirely different than fielding ground balls out here. Um, so how we adjust to the speed of the game outside with wind, sun, faster game, takes time. I don't think there's anything else we could do, the kids could do in terms of preparation. They've, been, they've done phenomenal work. Couldn't be more pleased.